the critical elements of a good publication agreement will be a, a license to the publisher. Now, conventionally, you'll often see a transfer of the copyright to the publisher. I, I think our, our move and what we're seeing more and more around the world is a tendency not toward a transfer of the copyright. You, the author, hang on to that, but rather a license to the publisher. And then that raises the question, so what does the publisher need? I guess at a minimum, some rights of reproducing the work, distributing the work, if it's elect digital delivery, displaying it, transmitting it out via, via the internet. And so publishers do need some pieces of the copyright, but they don't need everything. They don't need everything. And as a result, here through the agreement, is our chance to create a sharing model. And this is now a sharing between author and publisher. So now we're beginning to split up the copyright and move it around. And take the opportunity in a good publishing agreement to specify some rights that are retained by the author. And among those that, we, that are of great interest today are the right to be able to deposit a copy of this work in a repository, such as we have here at Columbia. The right to be able to meet your obligations under the open access policy from, uh, regarding funding from NIH, and we're gonna hear more about that as well. And then the right to be able to use even your own work in connection with your own teaching, your own research, your own future endeavors. This is really important. And again, giving away the copyright under the traditional model undercuts even the author's ability to do good things with scholarly works. But understand the digital environment that we've got now. In a, in a wealthy university like Columbia University, you live inside a very pleasant walled garden. Right. You have the computer there, you want to do research, you pull up, you click on a link to a journal article, and voila, it comes up. What you probably don't realize is that you passed through a toll gate that the publisher has on their, on, on their database, where they check the IP address and say, oh, that's a request coming from a computer at Columbia University, I will serve up that copy. Right. There are folks outside the walled garden who, when they click on the link, they get the door slammed in their face. Okay because they're outside the wall and they can't afford to pay it to get in. That's the current information environment we're living in and I'm, I'm gonna challenge you to make an argument for why that's a sustainable, desirable environment. Uh, and I wanna argue to you that in fact, um, there's a much better digital environment that we can have for scholarly communication that's economically sustainable, that's environmentally sustainable, um, and will improve the, the overall enlightenment project of scholarship um, and the transmission of knowledge. I'm here to present you with an opportunity. Right? This is a world of opportunity to create a better, more uh, in exciting information environment. Right? And the reason I'm here to talk to the authors in the audience is because you're in charge. Right? Um, under the rules of copyright that Kenny just explained, copyright is automatic. This has been a feature of copyright law since 1710, uh, where the author gets the rights. Right? Um, so understand, you're sitting at your computer writing that first draft. You don't know it, but federal law is over there hovering above you. And the minute you save, federal law showers down upon you a set of exclusive rights. You are now a copyright owner. Congratulations. Right. And so the question is, what are you going to do with that copyright? Um, and the standard story for copyright doesn't fit the scholarly author, or at least the scholarly journal author. Because the standard story is that the reason we give, the law gives these exclusive rights is to give an incentive for the author to write this, because they need to get paid for their activity, and they will then transfer the, the rights to a publisher who will share the revenues the publisher makes with the author, that will stimulate the creativity. That's what Stephen, that's Stephen King's model, right? That's a one version of, of copyright. How many folks in the audience have received a royalty check for their journal articles? No, that's not the, this is not, 
So the one size fits all copyright story doesn't fit here. The reason that we can treat copyright differently in this space is because the motivations, the incentives, the economics are different, right? Researchers write for these reasons, it's about impact, it's about dissemination. So in fact, the walled garden is not in the researcher's interest because it's gonna be slamming the door in the face of potential readers, uh, which is uh, not in the author's interest. Okay, so, uh, we, but we currently have a reason for the walled garden. The standard routine is author submits manuscript, gets a letter of acceptance, and then uh, signs a copyright agreement. Or now some publishers have you click a little I agree button as you submit and the copyright deal is done. Is it a fair deal? I don't think so, right? Uh, so here's one of the worst. A scholarly society, the American Chemical Society, um, the terms of the deal are give us your copyright, we'll give you 50 physical copies. You wanna distribute more at a conference? We do have a license fee for that. We will sell you back your own article, right? And we will sell it to your institution and it ain't cheap, right? Um, okay, why, and, and this agreement gets signed hundreds of times uh, a month, probably thousands of times a month, why? Because it's part of the routine. And there's a reason for that. Be, prior to the digital environment, um, there weren't a lot of alternatives. That was the game in town. It was the only game in town. It was the only form of communicating with readers. So you just did it. It was part of the routine. Okay, but we now have choice. We, and, and when you have choice, ethical considerations, practical considerations change. Not everyone agrees that the open access um, uh, world is the world that we should be moving towards. Um, and in particular, the journal publishers who have uh, um, traditionally charged extremely high subscription prices, right, that have us up here in the stratosphere, have fought very hard against the idea of uh, this broad distribution. Not because they're against the idea of broad distribution, but because this broad distribution cuts into the profits that they have for their exclusive perpetual distribution license to your work, right? Right now there's no way in a subscription-based environment for anybody to get access to the results of most commercially published research without paying a subscription fee or an access fee now and into perpetuity. In an open access world, that barrier is removed and so the ability of publishers to reap uh, uh, the, these large uh, profits into perpetuity is limited severely. Um, but what we're seeing is because scholarly publishing is such big business, right, we're talking about profit margins that, that reap publishers, particularly in STM, upwards of six to seven billion dollars in revenue per year, billion with a B. It's huge business. So market analysts cover the scholarly publishing marketplace quite thoroughly, and they've recognized that there is really is a battle going on right now where policies on the one hand, like the Harvard policy and the NIH policy are coming out that are encouraging uh, um, authors to, to manage their copyrights in a way that makes their work more openly accessible. Um, but on the other hand, there's a pushback from the publishing industry to try to keep hold, of, keep control of these copyrights. This system's working very well for commercial publishers, thank you very much, and they don't want to change it. Um, Exxon, uh, BNP Paribas, for example, last year in an analysis of the um, scholarly journal marketplace noted something that I think is really important and shows why copyright is really at the center of this battle for control over dissemination. Um, they noted that in their view, the economic model of journal publishing is really based on selling access to an aggregate of non-proprietary academic content. And they understand that while if you sign it over, the publishers own the exclusive publishing rights of scientists' work, we don't share the view that they own the intellectual property of that work. You would think that that would be pretty obvious, right? Well, unfortunately, there's a bill in front of Congress right now called H.R. 801 um, that would actually amend copyright law that would create a new class of copyright protected works largely in favor of the publishers that would, that, that, that says that if an article has been essentially undergone the peer review process that the publishers can claim ownership, copyright ownership of the article even earlier in the process. So there's a, this is a really active area um, and it's a really important area for scholars to be aware and involved and um, uh, actively engaged.